roll it. Oh yeah. Four pre-rolls. New year, new goals. Factors here to help you achieve each and every one of them. Factor. Save time. Have the energy you need to tackle everything on your to-do list with Factors ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. Head to factor75.com slash jrvp60 and use the code jrvp60 to get 60% off your first box. We had it sent to us. Delicious. That's code jrvp60 at factor 75 dot com slash jrvp60 to get 60 percent off your first box if you're looking for a fresh look stitch fix has you covered go to stitchfix.com slash jrvp to get 20 dollars off your first purchase purchase within two days of sign up to get 20 dollars off at stitchfix.com slash jrvp wearing some stitch fix jeans right now athletic greens is back if you're looking for an easier way to take supplements Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash JRVP. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash JRVP. Check it out. Finally, it's Black Buffalo. If you are 21 or over and use products like smoking tobacco, it's time to join the Black Buffalo herd. Head to blackbuffalo.com and use the promo code JRVP at checkout for 20% off your first order. That's the best offer you'll find, but you have to use the code JRVP for 20% off your first order. One last time, promo code JRVP, 20% off your order at blackbuffalo.com. That's not all we got today, by the way. We've got uh, some great emails. We've got Recommendation Station. What if I didn't give you any specifics in the top of this show? I'd say you're mailing it in. You wouldn't even know. It's all happening in episode 190 of the Jesselnick and Rosenthal Vanity Project. JRVP. Junior Vice President. Gratitude is a sickness suffered by dogs. Frazzled. The perfect game's already gone. You know? I don't think you ever had an intention of a perfect game. I had a perfect game. I, But I mean even just uh, stumbling over the intro a you little bit You didn't know here. you were pitching today. You didn't have an intro. Normally you'd like set up, you hear a couple yeah. of stories, hear some teases. What happened this week? It's been too long. You know, you got laryngitis, you got sick, it's two weeks. And suddenly I just uh, forgot how to do the show. I, I, I read the ads and I was like, oh, this is when Anthony comes in and Gives his little funny quote. Uh, I, I guess I am spacey. You called me that right before the show. Do you want to ask what my quote's from this week? It is Please a funny quote. tell me what it is. Gratitude is a sickness suffered by dogs. Funny quote. Uh, I looked up sick quotes because I was, I was sick. I was like, let me do quote something about being sick. <laughs> and I saw this is by your boy. And I was like, oh, I'll give, uh, I bet Greg knows this quote because you love this guy so much. You always Remember in college you were always talking about him? You thought about naming your son after him and then didn't? Joseph Stalin. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Stalin. Gratitude is a sickness suffered by dogs. I don't even know what that means. I don't know what it means. You shouldn't be. You shouldn't have gratitude. You shouldn't be grateful. Don't go to cafe gratitude. It's for dogs. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, everyone has weird things they get into uh, during college. Mm -hmm. Like we shouldn't be responsible for that. Yeah, big yeah. Stalin guy. Big Stalin guy, Greg. Uh, it's okay. It's all right. How are you doing? Much, much, much better. Still, like, I don't, you get sick, and then for, like, weeks afterwards, you still have, like, a little bit of a cough. You know, it's like you're not, you, like, if, you, if I don't have Kleenex on me, I'm, like, I'm a little worried. But uh, two uh, two weekends or 10 days ago or whatever, brutal. And I, I still don't understand what exactly happened because if you go back to the last podcast we did, I'm fine. I am 100% fine in that podcast. I, I look good. I feel good. Uh, Although I, I had a better jacket on, and the uh, the YouTubers were noticing, they really liked my jacket. They that didn't was really jacket. notice your jacket. You pointed out in a text to me, like they didn't even notice my five thousand dollar jacket uh, because my jacket. I mean, I've had that jacket for, for many, many years now, uh, so it's not going to be like the set the world on fire. What was funny, though, was in the comments, people were like, where do you get that jacket? Where do you get that jacket? And the answer, if someone answered them, was usually, it's probably Emica's. So who knows how much they really liked it, but it was a sharp jacket. I uh, did steal some eyeballs. I probably wouldn't have told people how much my jacket cost on the air, but that's Greg. <laughs> that's Greg swooping into my life and spilling, spilling his guts. Uh, so anyway, I, I leave the podcast last week. 
I felt fine during the podcast. I get home and I'm not feeling great. I'm like a little more tired than I should be. My th- I feel something in my throat. It's not scratchy. It's not bad. But I'm like, I've got to go to bed super early. I've got an early flight to go to Raleigh. I go to bed early. I get up. I feel okay. Get on the flight. Flight's okay. I get in that night and I'm like, this is, this is bad. I've got to like damage control. So I go out to like a, I go to like a steakhouse with my opener down the street from the hotel uh, and just eat like a big, just chunk of meat. Just like get this protein in me and I'm pounding water, lots of water. I get some lozenges. I get some vitamin C and stuff. I've got my athletic greens. I'm going to do my best. Wake up Thursday. It's a little bit worse. Do the shows and my voice is leaving me. I sound scratchy. I don't sound great. And there's like, I know there's like really nothing I can do. I've never really lost my voice. I've been sick on stage, but the adrenaline gets you through it. So I'm counting on the adrenaline. I wake up Friday and I'm in trouble. And I'm trying, I'm calling around. I'm trying to get my team to get me a steroid shot, which happens. I did, I think I did one on the Jesselnik offensive. Like the second season, I got really, really sick, like three weeks before the end of the season. And there's nothing I, I would think, pump me full of whatever you need to get me through this, the rest of the season. And I know that like actors will do it sometimes. If you really need it, like, it kind of gets you through the next couple of days. And you get a little bit more sick afterwards, but it helps you there. And we could not find the steroid shot. I get an IV. A nurse comes with an IV, wow. pumps me up. I get to the show. Who's shows. calling for the IV? You're... My manager. I, 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 t- I text everyone and I'm like, guys, I'm in trouble here. And I've never had this on the road. I've been sick on the road, but I'm like, never like my voice is going. Like, I don't know if I can do this. And uh, they get me the IV. I'm a little bit better. A lot of it's like they put a lot of ibuprofen in it. It's like my throat that is like swollen up a little bit, goes down a little bit. But doing the shows, anyone who's at the shows could tell you I sounded like, I sounded bad. I'm getting, I'm, the words are fine. I'm, I sound scratchy. I can't. I can't change my voice. I can't, like, there's a couple times where I, like, I'm a little bit louder. I say things differently. That's gone. But the shows are great, and it's a brand new club. I was the grand opening of this, of new Charlie Goodnights in Raleigh. So I feel a pressure, like, I want the club to do well. Uh, and it doesn't even occur to me that I won't be able to finish the weekend, but I'm like, and, there, and the club is like, what can we do for you? And I'm like, I don't think there's anything. I'm just pounding fluids, and I'm doing everything I can to, like, sleep, take care of myself. I wake up Saturday, and it's over. It's like, mm. my throat's gone. I text uh, my team again and I'm like, guys, like, I'm going to do what I can to like even try to get through half a show tonight, but I don't know what's going to happen. And I know I've got to cancel next weekend because of how bad I feel right now. My, and my agent gets back and he's like, listen, we're, we're going to cancel tonight. Like, uh, you sounded really, really bad. We're going to cancel tonight. We'll cancel next weekend. Let's t- take care of yourself. It's okay. And my manager's like, you need to go to a doctor. And I say, and like, when I get sick, I turn into a baby. And this is how I knew. I was still like, kind of like manning up until she said, you should see a doctor. And that's when I say the immortal words, I asked you for a doctor yesterday and you sent me an IV. And then it's all hands on deck. Everyone knows, okay, Anthony's in baby mode. <laughs> they get me to an urgent care and they're like, let me, they Have test me. Have you apologized about this? About your behavior? No. It was, I, I said I said this, it was in an email, but that's when it's like the switch is swept, the switch has flipped and I'm in baby mode and they know like, okay, this is serious. He doesn't just not feel well. He's like, he's in bad shape to be talking to people like this. And I go to urgent care. They test me for strep. They test me for COVID, flu, everything. It's like, it's nothing. Uh, you have like a throat infection. You are not, your throat is like inflamed. You have to just like rest. You don't talk, rest, sleep, fluids. You're not contagious. So I go home, my opener, uh, Blair Soki, Saki, sorry, goes and headlines the night. Uh, they just want to get people in the club. She's like, it was like the attendance was half. They had to announce it to people like hours before the show that I wasn't able to be there, which is terrible. I mean, I've never had, I've, I can't even imagine having to cancel like one third of the weekend. I'm already there. I would have done anything to have done those shows. Mm. I feel bad for the club. I will be back in Raleigh. And I, I said, I'll even go do a whole nother weekend in Raleigh. Raleigh's awesome. Uh, the club was the club was incredible. I loved it. The shows were killer. Even being sick, I was like, "This is great." I'm just not enjoying it because I can't. I'm physically unable to enjoy this. But I would go back and do a whole weekend. I will definitely come back and make up those two shows. Uh, I feel terrible to the club. It was it could have been a great opening weekend. They were all sold out. I will be back to make it up. Uh, Fort Wayne, I had to cancel this weekend or this past weekend. I'm gonna do that. That's being rescheduled for this summer. And they they announce it. Fort Wayne puts out a thing being like, Anthony Jesselnik had to cancel due to illness. He'll be back in the summer. He'll be back in like in the summer. And people, my friends texted me to be like, are you okay? 
thinking that the, the announcement meant that I was going to be sick until the summer. No. I've got other tour dates I have to do. I will make them up when I can come back. But I think they've already booked it. I don't think they've announced it yet. But this summer I'll be back in Fort Wayne. And next time I'm near Raleigh, I will, I will come back and make up two shows, maybe four. I'll do 100 shows in that club. It's a great club. And I feel truly, truly terrible mm. for having to cancel. But it was awful. I, I, so I'm, I'm, Saturday I have, I have off. My uh, Blair goes out and gets me like a million bottles of water. Brings them to my room. And I'm just like drink. I'm just like pounding water, tr- like falling in and out of sleep. I'm feverish. And I go to sleep. I wake up at like two in the morning and I'm getting picked up at four to go to the airport. I can't go back to sleep. I take like two showers, just trying anything to like for comfort. And then I get on this plane. It's a 6 a.m. flight to L.A. And it's like the worst six hours of my life. Just like sitting there, couldn't sleep. Just l- sitting there, just like staring at the screen that like that little like where it tells you where the airplane is in the sky. Just waiting for that to go. Got home. I'm like shivering. No mood. You're not gonna watch a movie. No, Did, couldn't even imagine. Con- I couldn't concentrate in a movie. I couldn't read anything. I was just my. Br- I was in like a sickness, like brain fog, and I'm just trying not to cough, trying to blow my nose and let anyone know that I'm that I'm under the weather. Uh, finally get in, and I'm like walking through the airport, pissed. I'm so mad that I was like, if someone had been like Anthony Justin, can I get a picture? I would have killed them. It's like 8:30 in the morning. I've been up forever. I wanted to die. I got home. Immediately got home, my dog is like so happy to see me. Rummy's so pumped. I go, I take a shower, like a long hot shower. And then I just like put on like four layers and I cr- crawl into bed. And I laid there just sweating, shivering and sweating for hours. And with Rummy right next to me, huddled up against me, happy I'm home and like knowing something's wrong. It was very cute. And just for those couple of days, I was just going to die. And then the fever breaks. I sweat it all out. Damn. And it's been, it's been, a, a t- I'm so glad I have the next two weekends off before I go back out just to get this completely out of me. I know I sound better now. I feel much, much better. At night it gets bad again, but it was uh, pure hell. Pure hell. And I'm sorry to everyone who had tickets to the shows and, uh, and couldn't, uh, couldn't get to see me. I will be back. It is worth it. I mean, it's your, worth coming to see. Your sweater looks cozy. If I it was is, sick, I would want to wear a sweater like that. This is Not a new. cardigan boy. No. No, this is a camp sweater is what they call it. It's got a little hood, but it's very nice. It's a like dramatic it. story. I, I think Emika and Walker, my, you know, my wife and daughter uh, and son, Ellis also caught it too. I caught maybe the same thing. I don't know. Because they sort of lost, they lost their voice. And then you know how I know it was the same thing? Yeah. They went into baby mode. People going to ba- women. Women handle being sick much, much better than men. I'm kidding. They, well, my kids went into baby mode, but Emika not as much. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, it's okay to go into baby mode if you when you're sick. Aaron, how how are you when you get sick? Oh, such baby mode. Such baby mode. Like I used to when <laughs> I was single. When I was single in LA, I would get sick. Well, like back way back in the day, like in my 20s, I would get sick and I would just start texting. Like I ne- I was never like a like get home and like drunk dial. You know exes. But I would drunk dial just any girl on my phone that I thought might take care of me, that I thought <laughs> might come over and bring me medicine or bring me like soup or something, and I would just do it until someone showed up, and I had no, I had no problems with it. Uh, it was, it was, it was true baby mode, mm. but it's okay. But you got to be careful because you don't want to go into baby mode all the time. I'm a little worried because Walker, he just goes to the nurse at school, like all the time multiple times a week him and his friend they just like go to the nurse every other day he like went and he actually went home from school last week because he was sick and <laughs> i ran into a dad who was like volunteering in the class <laughs> and i had told walker because he always is just going to the nurse and i was like i know you don't feel well but we decided to go to school like don't go to the nurse today try not to go to the nurse today and he was volunteering in the class. And he said, <laughs> first of all, all Walker was doing was talking about how he, w- he felt sick and he wanted to go to the nurse. And they had like a project where they were writing things. And all he was writing was how his dad wouldn't let him go to the nurse. <laughs> <laughs> and then he just went to the nurse, of course. He only made it to like 9.45 a.m. So that was my bad. That was a day where he probably should have um, stayed home. And it was good that he went home. He, he legit was sick. Uh, but it's because, you know, you can't go into baby mode unless when it's necessary or else I don't know what's going on. Sure. You got to save baby mode right. for baby mode times. Uh, I But this dad must have thought I was 
like a monster. No, I'm sure he, he got it. I mean, he's, he's, he sees him going to the nurse all the time anyway. Yeah. When I was a kid, I went through a nurse phase where it was just like, I can get out of class if I go to the nurse. Maybe they'll send me home. Like, I just hated school. So I would go to the nurse. Well, yes, that's what's happening. And then the one time they called me on it. I'll never forget this. I think I was in first or second grade. I went to the nurse and they were like, Anthony, like, I remember I, the nurse was like, you're fine. I come back. I walk into class and before I get into class, the teacher meets me outside with the nurse and they're like, Anthony, you really, you're kind of overdoing it. Like you're, you don't have to go to the nurse as much. You're not sick. And I, I said, as I'm talking to them, I just get pale and then I threw up all over the place. <laughs> I threw up a French, I know it was French bread pizza wow. all over the place and they sent me home and they were like, oh yeah, you're, you're actually sick. And then when I got back, I was like, okay, I'm done with this nurse stuff. I'll find other ways to get out of class. But I think that's probably what it is. I think if you were like, listen, there are cooler ways to get out of class than always wanting to go to the nurse. Yeah, Maybe he, it'll work. He, he learned it from his, his best friend who does it too. Like during the World Cup, he really went to the nurse a lot and he was getting like score updates because they had the TV on in the nurse's station. So mm -hmm. this is what happened today. But then today he was, he was back and we got, we got like a call and like he just went to ask for something for his rash. Like a rash was bothering. It's just like, come on. He's got that. Uh, he's got to take care of that tattoo. For me, uh, for me, going to the nurse was about the. It was the only clean bathroom in my high school. Mm. Hmm. Clean and safe, and you wouldn't get made fun of for using it. You got made fun of for using the other bathroom. I assumed I would. I, that's look at Aaron um, over here having to pee. No, no, the other. Yeah, number two. More intense. Yeah. Aaron went to uh, the high school in like Uzbekistan. I don't know why they just took us straight, but it's like, <laughs> but there's no, there's no clean bathroom. I mean, I know it's a high school. Spell but it. U z e b i k s t a n. That's right. Um, <laughs> let's talk about uh, let's talk about the football games this weekend. I, I, okay. I, I watched the games this weekend. Uh, first game brutal, just ter not fun to watch. Uh, felt bad for the Niners, but that's you know that happens. Uh, just a, a, a downright ass kicking. Second game was great. Really enjoyed the game. Uh, people were complaining about the officiating. I don't think anyone was ever going to do anything about it because you're always happy. Someone's happy that people get screwed. You know what I mean? And like, I think the calls went both ways. But if, like, if, a, if a call is egregious and someone's like, oh, that was ridiculous, there are people who uh, a bunch of the country is happy that that team got screwed. Do you know what I mean? Right. But what I want to talk about is, I, and I think this is crazy, when they showed Jimmy Garoppolo on the sidelines of the 49ers game. <laughs> yeah, they did him no favor. And he's just got a huge smile on his face. Like afterwards when he was like, I wish I'd had a helmet, I thought he meant so you couldn't see my face. I wish I had something covering my face so you couldn't see me like laughing it up on the sidelines. I think, I don't understand why everyone's mad at him. What did they want? For Jimmy Garoppolo to be crying on the sidelines that they're getting their asses kicked when he's like out for the year? This team that did not stand by him at all, like brought him back on, he almost led them to the promised land. Uh, if he hadn't gotten hurt, he could have had a great season. But I also think there's something like laughing when you're getting your ass handed to you is okay. It's happened a couple times before. I forget that it was like a quarterback for the for the Cardinals years and years ago who was like laughing on the sideline with one of his offensive linemen when they were getting beat. Yeah. And after the game, they were like, what were you laughing about? And he's like, it's none of, none of your business. Like, it's okay. If you're getting your ass handed to you, sometimes you laugh a little bit. That I think I don't understand why people are, are jumping on Jimmy G. Like that's like he's like a bad team. I didn't know people were jumping person. on him, but I, it was funny that yeah they did him no favors. Just like I I doubt he was cracking up the whole no. uh, game, but the two times they went to him, he was cracking up. But yeah. the reason why he was cracking up is because someone said something funny. Yeah, it's not that he uh, came. He was just like thinking in his head, like, "Well, fuck Black Purdy." Like I'm so happy that our team's going down the toilet. No, something. Someone said something funny to him. It's probably some gallows humor, and he laughed. Exactly, it's gallows humor, and you're you're kind of like you, you just have to laugh in that moment. You you prepared your entire season for this. It's over. You're playing a better team, and it just it didn't break your way. You're getting your ass handed to you. Go ahead and smile. Go ahead and laugh. You don't have to sit there and fucking like and whip yourself, flagellate yourself, masturbate. What's the Aaron? What's the flagellate? Self-flagellate? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That means masturbate. You don't have to do that. You can, you can enjoy yourself even when you're getting your ass handed to you. Uh, where do you think Jimmy G goes next year? Houston, I think, could be one. Uh, they could draft someone and kind of pair him with Jimmy G. That's uh, an old Patriots guy is running the mm -hmm. front office there. Las okay. Vegas would be a potential place. What about back to if New If they England? don't get Brady, no, that would be weird. Yeah. I, think, I think they'll stick with, stick with Mac. Maybe he was laughing, though, because he's like, I'm out of here. You guys are cursed. Like, it's not just me playing quarterback for this team. It's like the most dangerous position in sports is everyone gets uh, 
terrible injuries. Yeah, brutal. Who do you think? Uh, and I, I do. Congratulations, by the way. I saw that you had. Do you know this, Aaron? Greg in September, first week in September, predicted. Uh, I don't know if you predicted the winner, but you said uh, Super Bowl would be Eagles Chiefs back in September. Did anyone else have that pick? Because it seems like now it seems like almost common sense. It wasn't like a crazy pick then. I don't know who they would have thought would have come out of the NFC besides the Eagles, but uh, but you you nailed it. You nailed it. Uh, was that week the one? Eagles were like the fourth the fourth most likely. Uh, yes, and I even said on this podcast, which people remembered, that I was saying I think the Eagles are going to win the Super Bowl pretty early. I had Eagles over Chiefs. Me and one other guy at NFL Network out of 48 people who like have to fill this out had the right Super Bowl teams. He's a former Giants front office member, Mark Ross. I think he had the Chiefs winning, so he had it flipped. But, but we both got our Super Bowl teams right. You're standing by Eagles over Chiefs? Yeah. Well, you got you to gotta ride it now. You got to yeah. stick with it. I would think so. Like, I'm, I'm, I, uh, here's the funny thing about Cincinnati is that like, Cincinnati-Pittsburgh rivals, they've had some brutal heated games. But Roethlisberger got hurt. The Cincinnati fans cheered for that. There's been some insane. I used to think I hated Cincinnati because of this. And now I, watching them this weekend, I think I just hated Vontez Perfect so much that it made me hate like Cincinnati as a whole. Then now I, it's hard not to root for them, but they made it real easy this week with the mayor coming out with the most like boneheaded move I've ever seen any mayor do, ever. Uh, by saying the the whole, the whole uh, make sure Joe Burrow's not your daddy. Winning three games in a row against these guys is not like is not the dominance you think it was. They still could have easily won. Burrow didn't have a great game. I felt bad for the kid who uh, who pushed uh, who pushed Mahomes out of bounds. Yeah, that was a terrible way to end the game. Terrible way to end the game. But I loved watching his teammates rally around him, except for the guy who screamed and bitched him out in the in the tunnel. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, I I feel for uh, for Cincinnati as a uh, as a city. And uh, I hope uh, you never make it that that close uh, to the Super Bowl again. But uh, but I, I, I was enjoyed. Gonna say that was big of you. But. I enjoyed the game. Uh, listen, I, we're rivals. But that's that's it. Healthy rivals. I'm I'm into it and now. With with Cleveland being who they are, uh, they're they're the enemy. They are the enemy. Uh, I can kind of I can enjoy uh, Joe Burrow. I like uh, I like Joe Burrow. Now let me ask you this too. Because I saw a tweet being like Joe Burrow has to now wear this home after the game. Joe Burrow wore like a pink denim outfit like a like a like a, a, a pink denim jacket pink pants like I I forget what the shirt was someone said he looked like a Care Bear on his way to the game which is like fine I like when people kind of dress up a little funky on the way to the game do the players wear the same thing home that they wore into the tunnel like into the game or do they have another outfit to wear is I it like sweatsuit another wear? outfit okay that would make sense because it's funny that you would wear something like kind of like flashy and then have to wear it after a big loss like that yeah, I think you you have a backup. I think you have two options. You have like the losing the game option. Although I can't remember him in his post game what he looked like. I think their move actually is to just wear like their uniform or not really dress to the post game if they lose. They don't put on nice clothes. They just like go there quickly. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know what they do with those clothes. Just go shirtless. And so next week he's a good looking guy. I mean that would have been. Some people were saying um, if Burrow had made it, the handsomest quarterback matchup in NFL history, Joe Burrow versus Jalen Hurts. I don't, I don't. I mean, I don't know. No, I can't think of the other ones in the past, but I don't know if I buy that. Okay, I mean, right now, I think if you were asking the average um, fan, average woman, uh, they would probably rank in the top. You know, they're certainly both in the top five, maybe the top two of current quarterbacks. You know, like they're hotties. I think and most so quarterbacks, are, the, most quarterbacks are good looking. <laughs> most quarterbacks are good looking dudes that I that eh. be like these guys are the best by far. I don't know. Okay. And Mahomes still looks like a little kid to me, which is hot. Right, Ma <laughs> which is hot. <laughs> More on that later. Ba uh, baby mode. That's baby mode gone wrong. It's very true. Um, any Aaron, you want to add anything else? What did you miss us last week? Oh yeah. Aaron sent me. Aaron sent me a uh, a uh, get well tweet or a get well text. Get well was, soon. Uh, gif. It was a gif, and I was like, yeah. th "Thank you, Aaron. That means everything to me," which was very nice because I could have been mean to you. I started uh, like getting ready ready for this move, and I had to, and I read the like 
Marie Kondo book, which mm-hmm. is faintly embarrassing, but like it was going around my house and I started, I picked it up. I was like, actually, I like this. I like this uh, idea of like yeah. getting rid of stuff. So it seems like a good idea. Mm-hmm. And so I got like, over the weekend, we gave away like 150 books or so. I mean, among other things, but that was, it was kind of painful, but I think it, I think it and, felt good. And how, do you, how do you feel about that? How do you give away your books? I, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. People have said like never give away books, like give away books. Like I, I, have, I had so, I had too many books that I find the ones that mean something to me and I get rid right. of Right. I still books. kept hundreds, but, and I'll probably get rid of some more, but yeah, I was amazed how easy relatively it was to get rid of 150 books. Uh, in this case, I went down to the last bookstore because uh, we were downtown anyways and I gave them there. That's great. I think giving to a used bookstore is awesome because then the bookstore kind of benefits from that. I, like, I, give a, I give to Goodwill because I'm like, people go into Goodwill and like they'll find cool books there. I think that's, I think that's fine. Sometimes a local library will have, uh, will take donations, but I'm, I'm all for giving away uh, books if they don't speak to you. What did you do with your DVDs? You were talking about, should I get rid of DVDs? Do I need physical media? Like that one I split down the difference. Uh, got rid of almost all <laughs> CDs and DVDs, but like kept a handful that I What'd couldn't bear What'd you to get rid of. I don't remember. Like talk to her randomly. I was like, I wanted to, I wanted to keep talk to her. Love me some uh, talk to her. Talk to her, of course, is the sequel to Look Who's Talking To. <laughs> uh, which ones did I keep? Now I forget. Rushmore. I, I don't know. Okay. I can't remember. Okay. Sounds like they mean a lot to you. <laughs> and now it's time for, did we get any notes? Did we get any notes? Notes. Uh, not really. We got no notes uh, last week. I think people, uh, you know, were sorry that the podcast didn't happen last week. I think everyone understood. I wasn't feeling well. Thank you for un- understanding. Thank you for understanding that I had to miss shows. Uh, to the people of Fort Wayne, people who were going to drive to Fort Wayne, people who made the trip to Raleigh. I saw a guy who had got a hotel room and then found out it was canceled. I'm sorry. I will make it up to you all. Um, and thank you to everyone who subscribed to the YouTube. I think we got uh, maybe a thousand, at least a couple hundred subscribers at the YouTube. But I've been thinking about this lately. Uh, and Aaron, I want to hear you tune on the, to, uh, chime in on this too. That a, I think sta- uh, podcasting is hurting stand-up comedy. Because so many, uh, so many co- com- every, almost every comedian has their own podcast. Um, and I think people are putting more energy into the podcast than they do their own stand-up. And it's still, when they go on the road... They draw because their stand-up, fa- their uh, podcast fans come and see them. They just want to see the the guy they listen to every week. But I think most even fans would say I like him better on the podcast than I do live. But I will go see him. Whoa. Doing that. And I think that's true, Aaron. Do, would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, probably. This there are there are personal. exceptions. There are for sure yeah. exceptions. You're an I, exception. I would yes. I, I would not say that Bill Burr stand up is suffering because of his podcast. No. Uh, or his, his several podcasts, but I think a lot of people it does. And I'm not going to name names, but uh, uh, if you gave an example, I'm sure you'd be right. Uh, but that's why I'm okay with our podcast being bad. I'm totally cool with us being bad and not uh, not putting a ton into... I was like, oh, yeah, I see these people who I don't like respect that much, and their views on their videos are insane compared to ours. Like 60,000, 100,000, where we get like 10, and we're happy with 10. And now I'm just like, you know what? Good. I'm glad that we get 10,000 views. I'm glad we have so few subscribers. And again, I want, I want, we, we put every, when well, we, we have sit many down, more, you know, we have by a factor of, of what, five to 10 listeners listening to the audio. Sure, sure. That, great. But I don't care. There are things we could do. Aaron could name 10 things right now we could do to make this podcast bigger. We're not going to do those things. I don't even want to hear what they are. I'm a stand up boy, Greg is an NFL boy. And this podcast is a meeting of those worlds for an hour, an hour and a half, where we sit and talk. And I love that people want to listen to it. I love our fans. But, and I would like to have more, but I'm not going to do anything to get that. Well, right. Wait, you could tweet it out just to subscribe on YouTube. I think that would help. Or put it on your uh, Twitter doesn't TikTok. matter at all anymore. Put it on your TikTok. That. TikTok's subscribe. probably going away too. I'm about what to hit, you, I'm about to hit, about? I'm about to hit half a million uh, followers on TikTok yeah, put, and put I'm seeing things. They're trying to get rid of it like subscribe. in the country. 
It's yeah, but right now I've, it's I guarantee well. it happens. I've put too much money there. They're gonna be like, all right, now it's gone. Although I do have a bone to pick. Now that I think about, it. I have a note for our listeners. No one came through at my around the NFL podcast live show and asked about JRVP. No. Now mul- m- multiple people did afterwards. They're, they're like, oh yeah, they never called on me, or I was gonna ask. Um, I was gonna ask a question like, what's the Cleanest part of the human body, the dirtiest, dirtiest part. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Take a week off and everything goes to shit. <laughs> what's the dirtiest part of wait, the wait, human wait. body? Ask, ask Aaron, ask me what's the cleanest part of the human body. Shit. Uh, Anthony, what's the cleanest part of the human body? Not the butthole. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, this listener told me, uh, he's like, yeah, I just didn't know if you would, you would have liked that or not. I was like, are you kidding me? I, w- I would have loved that. Who cares what Greg would have liked? I would have loved it. <laughs> right. I would have I would have loved it. He's like, I didn't know if you were a joke. And then, yeah, another one came up to me. He's like, well, I've heard what you said on JRVP that you, like, immediately, like, respect people less if they're a fan of yours. So I feel like I'm in a tough situation here. I was like, well, that, that's not what I meant. Now I, now I feel bad. It happens. How was, uh, how was the live show? It was fun. It was good. What, what would happen if I went to a live show of you? Because it was, it was close to where I live. I yep. could have gone. I think I was out of town that night. A lot of people came from out of town. That was what was amazing because we never did a live show that wasn't in a Super Bowl city in the U.S., which people can't just fly to. So like, people were coming in from the Bay Area. There were some people there from Alaska, Chicago. It was crazy. I like that venue. Are you going to do another live show at the Super Bowl? No. It's a lot of work. <laughs> what, what, just putting up with those two guys? or No. I mean, it's... Um, it's stressful. I mean, I, I, I would love to be like a, a live performer like yourself, but like we don't have like a show that's just like a tight 75, uh, 80 minutes. So we every time we're, we start from scratch and we, we put a lot of work into it and it's just like, shoot, throwing that in the middle of a, a Super Bowl week is tough. So we did it here. It was fun. Cool. And that was, did we get any notes? And that was, did we get any notes? Is that a new one? That's like the original one, but we never play it because the other one is better. I like that. We, we never it. play it. I'm still playing it. You never play it. Aaron was supposed to step up. Maybe he would uh, be better here. You guys yeah. hear that bus rolling over me? <laughs> Aaron has once again passed on. Uh, he tried to explain to me today. He was like, yeah, it's a soundboard. I'm looking for a soundboard. I got, I got PCs. I don't know what you're talking about, Aaron. It's, it's buttons. It's fine. It's buttons. It's fine. I think I've, I have gotten more used to it, but I, it is amazing that either, either it's the, that I've had a stressful or long day or that the week off, I'm just like, I'm struggling here. Got to get back into it. Everyone's, everyone's struggling. Everyone's a baby. We're all babies today. And now it's time to take it down to a little place. It's got babies wall to wall. It's email corner. It's email. It's email. It's email corner. It's email corner. I told you to play the one that says emails are a thing. Email corner. Email. Emails are a thing. Do you know why I like that one more? I told you to play this one. Do you it's know why I like that one more? I don't know, baby. You went baby emails mode on Because emails there. are a thing. I am in baby mode. I get another week of baby mode. Bring me some fucking Kleenex. <laughs> uh, you can email us at jrvpjuniorvicepresident at gmail.com. Go ahead and review us on iTunes, too. All right, let's uh, start with a question Smash from Smash that like button. <laughs> so you say you don't care about the YouTube uh, I'd like, subscribers, I just like saying, but then you do like like erotic and exotic dances uh, when the, the email corner song plays that people just have to see. Two totally separate things. <laughs> Two totally separate things. Uh, Jake asks uh, about a story he heard told in early 2021 by comedian writer Sean O'Connor. Of Your Two Dads fame. Okay. On an online show hosted by the amazing Trevor Moore, rest in peace, Sean said that he heard Anthony was writing for Fallon once and pitched a joke slash sketch regarding pinata blood and said, quote, it doesn't have to be real blood. Sean said after saying that Fallon just stared at Anthony and Anthony just stared back and it lasted nearly five minutes. 
<laughs> Sean wasn't there. He said he heard about this from another person. I'm curious if there's any truth to this story. Love y'all. Take care. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of truth to that story. Here's what I, I think I've talked about this a little bit of working on Fallon and what it was like for me. It was a very <laughs> frustrating experience. Uh, but I, but Jimmy was a good boss. You know what I mean? I didn't always love the choices he made, but he never yelled. It was never like weird, except for once a week. Like one of the reasons I became a comedy writer or like wanted to get into that was because of like sitting around a table with a bunch of comedy writers like laughing about shit. I never got to do that. There would be a morning meeting where they would talk about what went on the night before, or things they wanted to do that week, and I would, they, and everyone would be sitting there laughing, all the writers, except for the monologue writers. The monologue guys, I'd gotten there hours before everyone else, except the other monologue team, and we'd be in a room next to that room, typing away, trying to write my like 75 jokes that day that I had to turn in by like noon, and I would hear them all laughing about whatever the fuck before they went off to like write sketches, and it drove me nuts. And then once a week, they would make all the writers come in after the show and pitch ideas for like segments, not jokes, but like segments that they would do, you know, uh, after the monologue or like in the middle of the show. And these guys and, and everyone else has been working on these all week, except the monologue team has been writing jokes. So like right before we went in, we would just like scribble down some shit. And it was always humiliating because it would be people who have like prepared this thing. They have like pictures and shit. And then it like gets to me and I'm like, uh, I don't know. Like what if we did this? And they just like, and they would like roll their eyes and move on to the next thing. And I hated it. It was mm. humiliating. And so occasionally I would come up with an idea that I actually liked. And all the other writers would think it was funny, but it was like not for the show, but I would just lean into it. And I was so mad that I had to be there for these meetings that I would, I eventually kind of bled into how I treated Jimmy. And there were like two instances <laughs> where Jimmy would be flat out angry at what I had pitched. And I did not care. And we would have like a stare down, like a stare off. One was when I pitched uh, The Great Pumpkin from Charlie Brown's uh, Halloween special, comes out for Halloween, and visits the studio audience. And Jimmy's like, well, that sounds cool. I, uh, Great Pumpkin's great. And then Jimmy would say, why, Great Pumpkin, why don't you ever reveal yourself to the Peanuts? And the Great Pumpkin's like, those losers? And be like, Charlie Brown sucks. And then we just go through all the different <laughs> Peanuts and talk about how ha much he hated them. And Jimmy immediately like hates it. But I could tell he hated it. Because if Jimmy didn't like something, he would just start texting on his phone. And I would just keep going. I'm like, let's see what, if I can actually get a reaction out of him. So I just kept going through different Peanuts characters <laughs> until eventually they were just like, stop this. And afterwards, the producer was like, what, the, what are you doing? And I'm like, I, I got to do something. I hate this. But Pinata Full of Blood was a thing I thought would be a fun, like a making fun of the audience games we would play. To have audience members come down, blindfold them, and hit a pinata that was filled with blood. <laughs> and blood would go everywhere and they'd be horrified and Jimmy like looks almost visibly sick and I go and everyone's kind of like what is Anthony doing and then he, Jimmy's like oh. and I go Jimmy it doesn't have to be real blood <laughs> and then by the other people laughing like egged me on and then Jimmy and I literally just like stared at each other for not full five minutes but it was a while to the point where someone had to be like, no, let's move it on. Let's, 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 let's keep it going. But it was, uh, those, those times were always uh, fun for me, but I truly hated, I remember my last day at Fallon. It was a Friday. And we usually did the pitch meeting on a Thursday, but this Friday, it was the, we had to do the pitch meeting on Friday. So it's my last day. I turn in my jokes for the day, and then I had to sit around and wait for a pitch meeting. And I was like, I had I'd left on such good terms, I wasn't gonna leave before that. So I had to go in and then pitch Two, two things at the, at the very end. And I was like, guys, I've enjoyed this. I know I haven't always showed you that I've like been having a good time here, but I have enjoyed this job. I'm sorry to leave you all. I do care about you all. But this meeting, once a week, has been the bane of my fucking existence. Stop making the monologue writers come in here and do this. This is for other people, not us. And I think now they don't make the monologue writers do mm. it. But at the time, they did. But yeah, that was a uh, pinata full of blood. A change was agent a, was a on one. the way out. Uh, another one I That I would have done great, though. I it would have. But another one, the, uh, it was Peanuts, uh, Great Pumpkin, Pinata Full of Blood, and my favorite, Cats versus Babies, where it was like a UFC type thing where it was babies versus cats. Who's going to win, a baby or a cat? And the cat always won. The cat always killed the baby. <laughs> <laughs> I think those would have killed. Maybe not like Tonight Show stuff, but this was Late Night with Jimmy Fallon. Mm -hmm. It would have made me laugh. Pinata full of blood would be amazing. 
people would have noticed it too. Mm-hmm. All right, Mark asks, uh, you and James Acaster are two of my favorite comedic minds. I just listened to the episode of James's Dream Meal podcast on which you were a guest. It became apparent early on that James thought you were cool and wanted you to like him. You sensed this and proceeded to punish him for it for the rest of the show. I got to listen to this podcast. Question for both of you. Have you guys ever been in a social interaction where you really wanted a stranger's approval? How did it go? And how did you, uh, what did you learn for the experience? I'll get to the next question later. Let me first, let me talk about James Acaster for a second, because this was very early on in the uh, Jessel Nick and Rosenthal Vanity Project. JRVP. Junior Vice President. Very early on, we were at the Comedy Central Studios, and we were trying to figure out what the podcast was going to be. We weren't going to be a sports podcast anymore. We're figuring it out. And every week, I was kind of like... I was still working with Comedy Central at the time, and I was like, I've got to make this good. I'm working on a TV show right now. I'm on tour right now, but I want the podcast to be good. That anything that I could think of to talk about, I was like, let's start talking about it. And I had done a podcast called Magic Restaurant. Uh, I forget what it was called, but it was like you. Went, it was like with James A. Caster and this other guy. Um, whose name I'm forgetting it says right now. Dream Meal Podcast. It, that, it's, it, it was about a dream meal, but it wasn't. That's what it was called, and. Uh, and I, I go do this thing, and then like months later, months later, the podcast comes out, and I see like all these people like, this is the one, this is the one. Like the fans were upset, and apparently James Agcaster had gone and talked about this co- upcoming season, and he was like, there's one episode that I really didn't enjoy, and I think people will understand when they hear it. And then I listened to it, and I was like annoyed. Like I was annoyed that I would be invited on this thing and then they would complain about it in a way that I'm like, this is kind of how I act on everything. And when I talked about it on, the pod, on our podcast, I was a little more heated than I actually felt. Like I would kind of played into it. You and Eric are laughing. I go in a little more. I'm like, these kids, I'm like, I'm very disrespectful. And afterwards, and, they, they, and then they took that. Like his fans are protective of him and were angry at me over this. And people I asked about it were like, no, this is how you are on anything. I'm a bad podcast guest, but it can't be funny. And my agent texts me, and he's like, that was really funny listening to that. He's like, James A. Caster is actually a huge comedian. He's a, a British comedian, but he's actually like a huge, like a, a huge name, a big deal. It's very funny that you would talk about him like that. Uh, I've got to listen to that podcast. And since then, I've seen things come up where people are like, I actually like that podcast. It's funny to hear them kind of like off their game a little bit. And you were, I was just not the normal guest. I don't know what I would have done if I had listened to the podcast before or if I had known who James was before I did the podcast. Maybe I would have acted differently. Because I remember at the time, like when you're on a guest on a podcast, it's like being a guest in someone's home. You kind of follow them through the home, and if they like, hey, come take a tour, you take the tour. If they're like, you stay out of that room, you stay out of that room. You ask where the bathroom is. Like, I was kind of just following their lead and acting the way that I normally do, and they were kind of playing the, uh, you're a little intimidating thing, and I was like, okay, I'm into that. I listened to it, and I was like, I thought it was fine. But I do respect James A. Caster. I think he's a great comic. I think if we talked about it now, if we, I met him, we would laugh about this. But at the time, it seemed like a much bigger deal than it was. Uh, and I actually saw someone bring it up uh, recently, being like, does anyone actually like this episode? And people either really hate it hmm. or think it was fun. I'm glad some people find it enjoyable. I will never do something like this again. I was surprised to be invited on it and tried to play along as much as I could, but it was bad. Uh, as for the question... I, I want to listen to it now. I also think the funniest part of that email is uh, that you punished him for wanting your approval. That, I think Mark hit into something. There. I didn't make it easy on him, from what I remember. I think he would make a joke, and I would kind of look at him like, that's a joke? And I, I remember a comment was being like, he knows James is sensitive, and James needs to kind of... And I was like, I don't care about any of that stuff. But I do, th- I do think James is a great comic, and we'll laugh about this one day. Um, as for wanting a stranger's approval in a social interaction, I'm really bad at this, too, where I will be mean. I have met people... I remember meeting Chris Evans, and I think Chris Evans is cool as shit. I think uh, Winter Soldier is one of the best superhero movies ever made. And he came up to me at a party and was like, hey, you're really funny. And I was so goddamn mean to him for five minutes. <laughs> where he, I was like being funny. And everyone's like laughing and he's kind of like, ha, ha, ha. And then I, he walked away and I was like, why was I such a dick? Like, I wasn't trying to be mean. I was like being funny. But I was also just... If I see someone that I, who I want their approval, I go the opposite way. Then now I just stay away from people whose approval I want. If they come to me, like if we work together, okay, maybe we can talk. I remember meeting Jonah Hill once at a movie theater. And he was like, oh, you're so funny. And I was like, thanks. And then he was like, uh, uh, and he walked away and I was like, I think he's great. Why didn't I say anything? Why didn't I say like you were amazing in Wolf of Wall Street? Like I just, I shut down and I'm bad at it that I know to keep myself mm. out of those situations. How about you? If you met like, 
I don't know. Who would be someone that you could meet that you would give a shit about? I, Naomi Osaka, you know. How'd that go? We just, I mean, okay. I was but, pretty nervous. But it, yeah, but, but it's also a in a weird. situation where you're in a line of people waiting to meet her, so it's Fair. different than... We weren't meeting in a social situation. Uh, I can think of some work colleagues, you know, people that work at other networks, stuff like that, that you just, like, you respect their work and you want to impress. I would say the, the advice would be, you know, don't be so... Don't, try not to be too obvious about it. You know? I think it'd go the opposite. I, you can be obvious, be like, "Hey, I'm a huge, fan, I'm a huge fan of your work. I love your work." You don't have to go into detail and ask questions. You can be but, real, yeah, yeah. Be real. Like when Jonah Hill says that to you, and you like Jonah Hill, be real about how you like his work and why you like it. I guess I mean I've seen some colleagues that, like, when we're in social situations, people just start acting different around them. I've seen it around you too. They start acting different around them. They like try to impress them. They like get out of who they normally are and Mm -hmm. no one likes that. And people like you or, you know, I'm thinking of this person, like people, celebrities, people that people know, like they have such a finely tuned radar of like, oh, this person's trying to impress me and is acting a little differently than they normally do. And that's a big turnoff. Yeah, and I think also people will say like, oh, well, everyone kisses your ass, so I'm not going to do that. You don't have to kiss right. your ass. You don't have to be a dick either. Just be yourself. People are like, oh, yeah, I hated that one thing. I, I, don't, I love your stand-up. I don't like your podcast. You don't have to say that to me. <laughs> yeah, I got, okay. a, I got a few of those after the podcast that were, that were kind of nagging me, saying how like, they didn't like me for a while. And, but now, now I get it. Yeah, like, I don't like need a, to hear that. I, I, it's okay. You, you, can, you don't have to kiss my ass. You don't have to do this either. It's fine. Uh, all right. Let's, was uh, there another part of the? There was. Uh, well, they were just recommending James's uh, Netflix special. That was a, when when people when I did the podcast, people were like, "You don't know who these guys are. You should know who they are if you're going on their podcast." No, I don't. I don't have to know any of these things. I've seen some clips of James's uh, stand up. I think it's very funny. I'm not going to watch the special. I don't watch anybody's fucking special. Nate Bargatze has a special tonight uh, coming out on uh, on Amazon. Might have dropped today. I might watch that. I heard there's a bit on there. Uh, uh, Aaron, have you seen Nate Bargatze's new special? No. Nate Bargatze, I think, is one of the funniest comics working today. Uh, someone who I always try to watch. I hear that there is a seven-minute bit that he closes with about his wife shitting on his chest in bed that I hear is the funniest fucking thing. You gotta thing. watch it, then. I know. I might just watch it just for that, that, uh, that bit. If you know Nate, like, Nate is like, has, like, has his own kind of absurd thing, but then he gets real at the end with a seven-minute story about his wife shitting on his chest in bed that I hear is just incredible, and I can't wait to see it. I can't wait. What a sell. All right. Yeah. Our uh, last question is from Brendan. You guys do a recommendation station every episode. Not often we get to hear things you hate. What are some books, movies, albums, et cetera, you're sorry you ever had to sit through or popular works you think are overrated? P.S. I know Anthony read Anna Karenina last year. I thought that book was highbrow but boring as hell despite being considered a classic. What did he think of it? I'll, I'll start from in the beginning. I loved Anna Karenina, uh, and I get there are parts that are boring. There are parts that like deal with Russian government that I didn't really care about. Skim but those. I find myself still like thinking about that book, thinking about certain passages, thinking about certain characters that uh, that stays with you like no other book I've ever read. That it is truly classic. I'm glad I spent the time. I right now I'm trying to read a book called Dead Souls, uh, the, uh, by a Gogol. Russian uh, Gogol. Yeah, that I uh, that it's it's funny. But it's I'm not, I, I, I read 100 pages and I put it down. I'm going to go back to it, but I'm going back to some, some things I enjoy reading more, and that's okay. Um, I don't like talking about things I don't like. I don't like, especially on the podcast, I don't want to like If someone's like, did you see, my friends were talking about Paul T. Goldman, and I watched Paul T. Goldman on Peacock or whatever it was. Didn't, didn't love it, but I don't want to talk about that. It's, I find it like boring to talk about things that you hate. Uh, talk about things you like. It's it's more interesting to hear somebody passionate about something they love than just shitting on something that maybe just wasn't for them. It just wasn't for me. If you enjoy it, go ahead and enjoy it. I didn't want to have like a anti-recommendation station where we talk about Aaron. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'm offended by the Anna Karenina takedown here. The Anna Karenina, I don't know if I just convinced myself of this, but it almost uh, like changed my life. I was reading it, and I loved reading Anna Karenina as much as any like book in the last 15 years it was about it was about 10 years ago now and it was right when i was deciding whether i was going to leave my job at the nbc which was very at nbc which was very comfortable or take this job at the nfl and somehow i found inspiration uh from anna karenina from some of like the the way they operated in that book uh to like go go for it 
You know? no, I, mean, I think it's it's an amazing. Uh, I don't remember exactly novel. how uh, now because it's ten years later. I can't really remember, but I remember it being like incredible. It deserves its reputation. It has earned it. And again, if you spend the time, uh, I've read books like I remember reading um, in, uh, Infinite Jest, and it was like it, you're, it's it's a commitment, and you hope that it pays off in the end. And I there were I there were, I took a lot of great things out of that book. But I didn't ultimately uh, didn't abs- didn't worship it the way a lot of people did. Um, but uh, but yeah, Anna Karenina, it's worth your time. If you if you if you can't finish it, who gives a shit? Read something else. But it's great. I did. It did make me think of some classics or something that like you think I don't know about overrated, but that I, I didn't get. Huckleberry Finn didn't really get Huckleberry Finn. I love Huckleberry. I read. Finn. I reread that maybe seven or eight years ago, and I, I still don't quite get it. Why it's why it is what it is. I love. I guess Mark it's Twain. like the it's like the ultimate American thing, but I, I had a hard time with it. Anything Steinbeck related, I didn't. I kind of struggled with, with Steinbeck. I don't know. Of mice and men, still hilarious. Ayn Ayn Rand, but everyone shits Fuck on Ayn Rand. Rand. Fuck that shit. It's like I was trying like, to think of movies. Like, uh, people keep raving about Dianetics. I, I wasn't into it. I, I was trying to think of movies <laughs> like that, like. Tree of Life was one that I thought I would love because I love Thin Red Line and like people just love Tree of Life and I struggled with Tree of Life uh, in person. But it like might just be because you're in a bad mood that day. Sure. It might be you're, you're not in the theater. Like I recommend movies all the, the time theater, yeah. that, that people are like, I hated that. And it's like well, the, way, the, when I, the way I saw it, the mood I was in, I enjoyed it. Like I skinned him a rink a couple weeks ago. A lot of people are like, I fucking hate it. It's like I get it. I, I, can, I can't argue against hating it. But I really enjoyed it for, for what it was. I like something crazy different. Um, and I rec- I'll recommend things that are just like bonkers. I can't believe this was in a movie theater. That's why I loved it. Uh, that, uh, that that's okay. That I, I, again, talk about things you like. Um, it's not fun to talk about things I hate. This reminds me. I hate plenty of stuff. While you were, uh, before you got sick, I did some homework and watched, because I just hit HBO Max, the last two John Wicks, because I'd already seen the first one. And? Two is kind of forgettable, but three was, three was much better. I, I'm, I love them all. I just like spending time in that world. And the opening scene of John Wick 2 is incredible. Yeah. Yeah, where he's getting hit by cars and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I love them all. Like, just Spoiler. mash them all together and let me watch John Wick forever. I, uh, I love those movies. I can't wait for the new one. And that was? Email corner. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, I just thought of something else I didn't like. You, Easy Rider. You ever watch the, some of those old movies that, like, you can see why it's influential, but it just doesn't it doesn't make sense anymore. Easy yeah, Rider. Sure, but I think, but when it comes to old movies like that, it's like, oh, this is kind of boring, cliche. At the time, it was revolutionary. Sure. And, and it, it's, I get that. And a lot of the reasons it's cliche is because people keep copying it. That I was like, okay, I watched it in film class in college. Same. I don't love. The, I don't want to go back and watch a lot of old classics, but when I, when I do, I can try to appreciate them for what they are. Try to put myself in the shoes of someone seeing it back then. You know what? Speaking of things we love, now it's time for <laughs> Ad Copy. What a transition. It is a new year, and we've got a new sponsor. It's Factor. You got goals. Factor's here to help you achieve each and every one of them. You can save time and have the energy that you need to tackle everything on your to-do list with Factor's ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. So we got Factor in the mail. Mm-hmm. It was a nice surprise. We we heard that they were coming on as a sponsor, but we didn't have a warning. And then just the Factor meals show up. We got some smoothies. I think we got about six or seven different meals. Uh, they're fresh. They're not frozen. You put them in the microwave. They're ready in just two minutes. All you got to do is heat them up Aren't they frozen? and enjoy it. No. Oh, I froze mine. You froze them? Yeah. <laughs> I accidentally, I fucked up. This that is really funny. Uh, there's 34 different chef prepared, dietitian approved weekly options. So there's always something new to try. I liked uh, the meaty ones. There was a chicken with a, a great sauce. I wish I remembered it off the top of my head right now. Uh, I like the variety. Like they were all very solid. Like a good like filling protein. Uh, with I, some vegetables. I think it's it's convenient. If you want to do keto, a keto diet works. It's just such a pain in the ass to follow. But if you do, if you use... They have keto well, options, yes. But yes. it's not just keto. No, no it's not uh, just keto. But that's yeah. what I... Like, I'll, I forgot to say this when I said I got sick. Since from the time that I went into urgent care on Saturday to Monday, to yesterday, when I went to the gym for the first time since I got sick, I've lost 10 pounds. 
Whoa. 10 pounds of where I'm just like pounding water, no appetite, 10 pounds. And I'm like, let's see if I can hold this off that I, I would do. I would enter into keto, but I don't want to make that keto shit that having a uh, having a, a keto little like uh, like not TV dinner, but a keto meal that you can just eat yourself is uh, makes all the difference in the world. Right. That's how you follow keto. Well, they, they have options. So if you want a keto option, you can. If you want a vegan or veggie option, you can. A calorie smart option. There's all sorts of different stuff. I went and looked up uh, the one that I like. It was the herb crusted chicken. Uh, they got the cheesy bacon ranch shredded chicken. So, so some of this uh, sun dried tomato chicken. I like the beefy uh, ground beef. It was a broccoli cheddar ground beef. It was good. Freshly walked so Factor could run. <laughs> it, honestly, like, it Freshly was. Freshly is dead. It showed up. Long live Factor. Right when the family got back from Japan, and, we were, and it was just like, sweet. We got meals for days. America's number one ready to eat meal kit. Start saving time, eating well, living your best year smoothies? ever. Smoothies? Also, they got the smoothies, yeah. That mm. was, that was, those were uh, delicious. Had brought them to work. It was like. Liz loves them. You know, the, the uh, prepackaged smoothies that were uh, delicious. Head to factor75.com slash JRVP60 and use code JRVP60 to get 60% off your first box. That's code JRVP60 at factor75.com slash JRVP to get 60% off your first box. Again, JRVP60 at factor75.com slash JRVP slash 60. Wait, did I just mess that up? <laughs> <laughs> Fix it. JRVP60 at factor75.com slash JRVP60 to get 60% off your first box. Is that like a 60% G reference? Or I, I thought you? it was. Uh, that is my nickname. Feeling very 60% G. Drinking that mango smoothie. You know what also uh, makes me feel 60% G? Stitch Fix. Now, when I said earlier I was wearing a pair of Stitch Fix jeans, mm -hmm. right now I misspoke. So what Stitch Fix does, do you even, do you know what Stitch Fix, because I'm the one who signed up. I got the free Stitch Fix sent to my house. I got some Stitch Fix. Okay. Back in the day. They why, why would you say that? Why wouldn't you just lie? They can't see your jeans. I'm just telling you. No, I'm, I'm going to explain, bro. I'm okay. going to explain. It. Okay. Stitch Fix is not um, a brand that makes the clothes. It's a company that has stylists who choose clothes from all different sorts of brands. So it's not mm -hmm. like Stitch Fix brand. I forget which brand it is. Uh, but I was really uh, pleased and like impressed and surprised with the box of clothes that they sent me. I answered a bunch of questions of like what I liked, what I didn't, my size. It all took about five minutes. Uh, they assign you a stylist and then they send you a box of like, it was five things for me. I think you can you know make it depending on how much you want. And they also send you a very easy, like resealable bag. And if you don't want everything, you send it back. And I didn't want the shoes that I got. Like I loved, there was like a hoodie and some jeans and this other shirt, loved them all. Didn't really want the shoes and you just put, put them back in the bag and you just drop it off at the mailbox and they take that off. You just keep what you want and, and return whatever you don't want. Stitch Fix, it sounds like a Liz. You know, I've got a Liz who will just tell me what to wear and I wear it, and it's great. If Greg had a wife who loved him, he wouldn't need Stitch Fix, but he doesn't. He needs Stitch Fix to send him stuff, give him things that he's gonna look good in, and then he gets to choose the things that he actually feels good in. It's perfect. If you're a dude who doesn't know how to dress, like us, you need help. Stitch Fix does it for you. You don't need women. You need Stitch Fix. Yeah, Stitch Fix, uh, they send you five pieces to try on at home. So that, that was it. And yeah, the returns are really easy. It, it's a mix of what you want. And you can even choose to keep the same stylist and like kind of, you like write little notes of like, oh, I like this. I didn't like this. You give a little score or like, hey, can you try to get me something like this? And so over time, like they know uh, what you want. Sign up today at stitchfix.com slash JRVP. You get $20 off your first purchase. That's stitchfix.com slash JRVP to get $20 off your first purchase. Limited time offer. You have to purchase within two days of sign up. Again, stitchfix.com slash JRVP to get $20 off your first purchase. Get yourself a Liz Stitch Fix. <laughs> and that was Ad Copy. Let's get to headlines. <laughs> All right, so Anthony, you tweeted about this next headline before mm -hmm. we uh, announced we weren't going to be here last week. Now, we, we talked about this story 
Uh, we talked about the story back in the day when this girl, I forget her name. Shauna Ray. Shauna Ray got a TV show. She looks like she's eight, but she's 25? Like 23. 23. Looks like she's eight. She's trying to find love. Yeah. And I remember at the time, I said in one of the classic uh, JRVP lines, the best she can hope for is you look like my daughter who died. And that you can't trust anyone. And maybe it's a guy she went to high school with who she's like known her whole life that she can trust. Like You're not looking for love. You're looking for someone you can trust. And you hope love blooms from there. What you don't want is what she got, which is like an influencer from England. Is he, where, he's from England. Started messaging her on social media. After she gets the TV show, they start talking. They're flirting. He visits like twice. They go on like little like vacations with the camera. He's got he's ripped. He's jacked. And like the picture I saw in the thing, they're like they go kayaking or something or like paddle boarding. And he's got abs, which means he goes to the gym all the time. He's trying to get famous at best. That's the best you can hope for. This guy trying to get famous and not I'm a pedophile and this is my chance. <laughs> because <laughs> both are bad. One is worse than the other. Although if it's like if it's a pedophile who's willing to put a ring on it, like isn't that have we ever heard of such a pedophile? I don't know. Aaron, look it up. Is that a thing? I mean, but does that even count? She's 23. I know, but she doesn't look like she's 23. That's the thing. People, when I put that tweet out, people were like, she deserves love. Absolutely. Do I think, that, do I trust this person? Again, you got to find trust first, and then you can find love. Otherwise, you don't know what the fuck is going on. I could, and this guy saying, the article was, you didn't read the headline, I'm dating a 23-year-old that looks like an 8-year-old, but I'm not a creep. <laughs> if you've got to say, like, but I'm not a creep, you're a creep. Like, it's, it's too weird. If he had just said, hey, I'm in love with her, everyone go fuck yourselves, I'd be like, okay, maybe. But this, this defensiveness in his introduction is a little off-putting, but I'd, would believe, I'd be willing to believe at best he's a fame whore trying to get his 15 minutes and not, I'm super into eight-year-old girls. I, again, she does deserve love, but you're not going to find it from an influencer. He's got a, he can't have an, he can't have a six pack. Can't do it. I mean, unlike you, uh, we were supposed to have an, I am Sean Ray viewing party. I don't know what it would have been. Just like, uh, an agreement to watch. I am Sean Ray mm -hmm. on this, uh, podcast. You never actually watched it. No, I didn't. Me and Lakeisha both watched it. I watched two or three episodes. She's still watching. They're in the middle of season two. That's where this guy shows up. Uh, is in the middle of season two. Doesn't appear that they ever uh, did seriously date, but he's definitely using this uh, these episodes to try to make himself more famous. He did the thing where he made a message to the camera after all this came out that people were getting on him that he's not a creep and just like tearfully said into the camera that Shauna Ray deserves love and that you guys don't understand what a special person is that she is and you're being cruel. And uh, he's doing that from England where he has absolutely no relationship with Shauna Ray. So it doesn't really seem like um, he's speaking like with great intention. Yeah, I mean, listen, I wish I was having an affair with someone that I could watch I Am Shauna Ray with too. Uh, I'm not. I'm glad you and Lakeisha are having a good time. Enjoy it. <laughs> but I do think it's crazy that this guy, they comes and visits while they're filming. He comes, oh, uh, this finale's coming up? I'll be there. <laughs> and then he's like, going back to England. I'll see you in six months when you start filming again. I don't trust this guy at all. The more he protests, the worse it is. Uh, yeah, she deserves love. It's, this isn't the guy. Now, in that tweet, you said, I think we would have spent 90 minutes on it mm -hmm. last week. But this week, now since we have another week to kind of germinate on it, we will spend three hours on it. So we have two hours... And 56 minutes left. That may have been, that may, I may have been playing it up for humor. <laughs> you know, I'm like a James A. Caster on the mic. I play things up. Uh, I don't, uh, I, I don't, I don't buy it. But again, a lot, most of the comments on the tweet were, she's 23, her face, they'd be like, her face doesn't look like an eight year old, but her body, that doesn't matter. It's fucking not good. She's what? three foot 10. Well, yeah, they. I did. I, I did some John Ray uh, deep diving, seeing what was going on with her. She was recently on a date with uh, another um, man who had uh, some sort of uh, handicap that he didn't grow either, and so great. Th that, great. That, that I think it was a fireman. I support that. I support a guy who's impotent, a guy who's impotent who just wants to protect her, like a big dude, but like, she, a, like an Aaron type guy. <laughs> 
who just who like can't have sex but wants to protect someone and have someone in their life. I I'm, I'm all for that. But this dude is not the guy. No, and she knows that. Here's the thing: is I don't think you realized that Shauna Ray is a badass, and like she susses out all these creeps. That's what the show is sort of about: is that either I get hit on by kids sometimes, mm-hmm. like literal ten year olds or yeah. eleven year olds. That's obviously a problem, um, or creeps, or just like. So those are basically the two categories. Oh, I, creeps I, and eleven year olds. Oh, I know, I know she I know she can suss them out because she's not responded to me once. <laughs> <laughs> I write her every day. <laughs> Shauna. Uh, so uh trophy hunting lions is a thing on Instagram. There are some guys, including this uh, overweight hunter uh, in Africa, I believe South Africa in this case, um, who like to kill lions and then, or, or uh, any you know big kills. And they put the kills on Instagram and they pose with them. And uh, the only problem recently for uh, this trophy hunter uh, with some followers on Instagram was he was eaten alive by the brother of the lion that he recently killed and displayed. I love I love animal revenge stories. Now the, explain this to me because I don't know. Uh, like so, he he kills the he he sees a lion. Yeah. He shoots it. He kills it, and then he's posing with it. And the and the brother comes up and kills him right there. Or he poses. He takes the kills the lion, cleans it, or whatever. Poses with it, puts it on Instagram. Comes back, and the brother's waiting for him. I question whether the story is true, but it's too good uh, that I just wanted to go with it anyways. There, there's been some claims of veracity, but what seems like it's happening? Did the guy die? Was the guy eaten by a lion? Yes, Are they just yes. like we don't know if it was the brother? Yeah, I feel like they look alike. They must be. <laughs> they're related. So, so what the story says is that yeah, that he, there was like an Instagram live um, that he was doing with the lion, and then with the dead lion and everything. So they knew where it was, and then later uh, in the same city, the South African city of. Palaborwa, uh, a man was heard screaming from a distance from people outside and saw uh, this guy go down. That he, he devoured most of the man. This is where I start to wonder. Most of the man before his body was discovered, uh, but his head was untouched. So the lion like found him like days later. I, I, yeah, I don't think it was like he saw saw in that moment and knew it was his brother. The part about it being the brother, I'm not so sure about. Him killing the lion and then soon after getting killed by another lion, that, I'm, that I believe. There was a story I remember hearing related, about on Instagram ultimately. where a guy, a hunter, shot a lion, trying to kill it, shot it, didn't kill it. The lion got away. Then the lion went to, this guy lived in like a cabin somewhere we would hunt from. The lion went to the cabin, just like got shot, ran away, went straight to the guy's cabin and waited for him to come home. And then killed him outside his house. I love that shit. I love when the lion's like, that was my brother. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fucking track you down. <laughs> it's awesome. It's a, it's a fucking, it's a, it's a Disney movie, if you will. It's Jaws 4, The Revenge. Disney. It's and- Jaws 4, The Revenge. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. I feel like animal revenge movies would be a good genre that, that we've explored, but we could explore more. We should, they're always cheap. There was that show Zoo, I think. It was based on a book by James Patterson. Where animals just start killing people, like just they just animals are just like we've had enough of this shit. Global warming's too much. We're gonna start killing people. So all the animals are coming after them. And I was like, great. But the TV show was on CBS. It fucking mm. sucked. Mm. It was not good. But animals killing people. I I didn't see what was it? Lion roar. What was the one with Idris Elba? Aaron. Oh yeah. It just came out. Uh, roar it is like might have been lion. I think it was literally called just lion. No. Crazy. No, it's not that. It's like pride. Um, or uh, let me check. I, I, did, I did see that trailer quite yeah. a bit. I, I thought I would, would Beast, love that movie. Beast. Beast. I, I have not watched that movie. Never got, never, uh, never sat down to watch it. But it sounds like it would be cool. I think if, you're, if you are a hunter, uh, no one gets mad when hunters get killed by the things no. they're, they're hunting. You get run over by an elephant, good. You get killed by a lion. Like, I don't think people should be eaten a lot. But if you're trying to kill them... These trophy hunters, cool. like they're like, oh well, the money raised by killing these lions is like used for local things in Africa. It's actually good. And, but I don't listen, know I'm that. from I'm from Pittsburgh. In Pennsylvania, deer hunting is like a necessary thing. If they didn't hunt the deer, 
they would be bad for the deer, but there would be more car accidents. The deer would, would uh, starve each other out. You kind of need to weed the population down. Baby seals, clubbing them. That's important for some reason. <laughs> what? Yeah. But if, if someone was clubbing baby seals and they got killed by, his, by the seal's brother, I would not feel bad at all. You know, it was a sneaky surprise um, animal revenge movie. So uh, we bought a zoo with Matt Damon. I didn't see that. That's good. Yeah. Do you really saw that movie? It's great. Some of Cameron Crowe's best work. <laughs> <laughs> there is a movie Roar from the '70s. It's low budget. It's made by Melanie Griffith's dad. Dude, I saw it. I, they, it only yeah, came out terrible. recently. They they lived on a lion pre, uh, a lion reserve, a, le, a preservation reserve of yeah. all lions. It still exists. And it's they were like, real. "Let's make this. Let's make a movie here." And people were hurt real bad. People are, because uh, the lions were like doing a scene with the lion, and the lion's cool, and all of a sudden the lion's not cool. I think Melanie Griffith got fucked up. She's yep. a little kid in the movie. Yep. But you see them, and it looks dangerous as hell. No one's having a good time. And when it came out on VHS I, or DVD, I bought it and brought it home for my family to watch. And my mom is laughing hysterically. The kids are kind of <laughs> laughing. My dad is like horrified. At one point, they shoot a lion. And it's not real, but they don't actually hurt any lions in the movie. The lions hurt the people. Yeah. But it is, it's, it was an ill-conceived idea that, uh, watch it if you can. Watch Roar. Yeah, it's on YouTube. Check it out. A longtime theater director at a high school in Texas is being sued after many of the kids in her most recent production said that the director told them to have sex in front of her. Did you read the article? I did. I did, yeah. Uh, this is great to me because... It, I the, always read it. The idea of a theater director, like they're directing, they, they've got these theater kids and they're trying to find things to like, to get them going. Theater kids are different. You know what I mean? You can kind of throw a little things at them that you wouldn't throw at other people. But having sex in front of you is probably not a good one. Uh, simulating sex, I don't think students. they were really having sex. Of course not. They, they were getting... Too close for comfort. They're, but they, they've got to simulate it. And it's like, what high school, What production are you doing in your high school? Yeah. What guys and dolls bullshit is going on that you need to have these kids simulating sex? You think you're being like avant-garde. You're like pushing these kids. I think this teacher was jaded as shit. And to be a theater teacher, a, a theater director in Texas at a Texas high school, that's got to be one of the worst jobs you can have, I would think. So she had it for 35 years. Super jaded. Was like, fuck this. I'm making these kids have sex for me. <laughs> they, the, the accusation said that they in, were encouraged to engage in open mouth kissing, groping, and simulated sexual intercourse. These intimacy sessions were nothing more than choreographed sexual assaults. They said the teacher was aroused during the rehearsals and at one point yelled, more, more, more. I mean, I think it was just like a, uh, a very regrettable way that this woman was living out some sort of sexual fantasies. Listen, if it was a guy, <laughs> if it was a guy, this, they, would, they would have been shot. They would have been shot and they'd have their lion brother come and eat them. But it's a woman. I guarantee she was just jaded. She probably just no. went through a breakup. She's, and she's like, I'm going gonna, gonna to help these kids. I'm going to push these kids to be the best actors they can be by fucking in front of me. <laughs> she, she was like in her 60s. She's been doing it for 30 years. I think she just had a weird uh, fetish, essentially. And the reason why the story's gotten even bigger is these kids that sued her and ultimately got her taken out of the job... Um, that got into the newspaper and now all these students from over like the last 20 years are coming out of the woodwork saying like, oh yeah, she would do that shit with us too. Like they forced, um, us to give lap dances and imitate sexual acts. They actually had named the theater of the school after this woman. And that's when all the old students got like really pissed being like, no, this woman's fucked up. Well, tell, I mean, let me know who, who came out of that program. You know, is fucking Denzel coming out of that program? Then maybe she had something to uh, leg like to stand on. But she's been doing this for 30 years. 30 plus. Like, 88, I think, is when she Was started. it a popular program? Because in Texas, yeah. you're either playing football or you're a theater nerd. And if you're a theater nerd, like, I don't know. If they did that in my high school, maybe I would have I tried out for musical. You know, if they'd been like, here's what we're doing. <laughs> they named the Fine Arts Center after her. Uh, but yeah, it sounded like there was a lot of, uh, as they say, manipulation, allowing sexual acts to happen under her direction, declining to remove or discipline, that she would like encourage the male 
uh, actors to like do things to the women, and she gave drugs to at least one student. Welcome to fucking acting, kids. <laughs> That's this is like the best you could hope for. I, yeah, it's it's weird to be a student, but you signed up for this. You want you want to be an actor? You got to go all the way for this woman in front of this woman. Do more. Be better. Act. You know, I was. Uh the winner of the Best Director Award at the One Act Play competition at Minichog Regional High School in 1996. I didn't. Aaron, best, did you know that? Best Director. Uh, I'd heard it, but I, I didn't believe it. And you know what? Uh, you know what I didn't have? What's that? Any inappropriate uh, touching or accusations? What did you direct from my actors? Um, it was called The Scheme of the Shiftless Drifter. It was a one act play. Did you write it? No. No. You came up with it I, what, what were they what, what were the plays they were doing what were the musicals they were doing that they would have had to have done this because a lot of acting exercises that are just like loosen up be comfortable and then I want to know what her reasoning was I would love to see her try to defend herself other than like it's high school kids what am I going to do yeah they said there's some like fondling there was some like grinding and some some like lap dances uh, doesn't I think I think um, I think she was right to be fired hmm Thanks for the editorializing, Greg. And now it's time for... Ad copy. Yeah, Athletic Greens. Anthony took it with him to Raleigh. And... Uh, I, I didn't stop drinking Athletic Greens when I got sick. I, every morning I would wake up. It, those are my vitamins. They helped me get through it. It was probably the best part of my day when I was sick, was just drinking my Athletic Greens. I love it. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, like, you notice the benefits in terms of improved digestion, um... Supports your sleep habits. Like, I'll do anything to help my sleep and uh, Athletic Greens just being healthy. All the vitamins that it has within it. Uh, Gut health. 75 different ones. It's just like a one-stop shop to get a lot of vitamins every morning. You put uh, a scoop in a cup of water and eight drink ounce, it. Eight ounces to 12 ounces. I go 10. I go 10 ounces. I've been going 10. I go, I go cold water. Blair Saki, who was with me on the road, she does Athletic Greens. And she does it with uh, with room temperature water. She pounds it. That seems weird. Why would you drink room temperature water like in any scenario, whether it's with Athletic Greens or not? Some people prefer it. I like cold, but I, and this is room temp right now. Watch this. I like my water cold, like my co-hosts. Uh, Athletic Greens, if you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash JRVP. That's athleticgreens.com slash JRVP. Got to check it out. Black Buffalo, also got to check that out. Black Buffalo is everything you love, nothing you don't about nicotine pouches or long cut you can use either one if you're over 21 try the tobacco alternative black buffalo it's made from a variety of cabbage leaves so it's like a different leaf but it's the same ritual as if uh as if you regularly dip but just a dip different leaf healthier sounds great different bi- different flavors wintergreen mint straight peach even blood orange uh again with you can even have uh without the pharmaceutical grade Nicotine. Uh, you can buy Black Buffalo online at blackbuffalo.com or at thousands of retail locations across the country. You can go to the website, check out the store locator. Uh, Black Buffalo, uh, we've been talking about it for a while. Nice packaging, authentic. And we, we've had a lot of people that, that use the Black Buffalo. Happy customers. That's great. If you are 21 and over, use products uh, like Black Buffalo, it's time to join the Black Buffalo herd. Head to blackbuffalo.com. Use the promo code JRVP at checkout for 20% off your first order. It's the best offer you'll find. You have to use the code JRVP for 20% off your first order. One last time, promo code JRVP for 20% off your first order. Black Buffalo, your tobacco alternative. And that was bad copy. Last headline. The Razzies are back. No, wait, dude, play the song. Play the last headline song. I like it. Last headline. Very demanding today. I like. I just like the song. It's one of my favorites that we play. 
the last headline song. The Razzies are back. Okay, the Razzies come back every year. The Razzies fucking suck. The Razzies should have ended. If you know what the Razzies are, the Razzies are the anti-Oscars. When everyone's making a big blow and smoke up everyone's ass about the Oscars, and this year I think it's been particularly annoying because of that one woman in the two Leslie movie who got nominated out of nowhere. It's like, was it fair that this woman got nominated? Who gives a shit? Who gives a fuck about any of it? Uh, but the <laughs> Razzies are super lame. And it started out as a funny thing. Let's nominate the worst performances, the worst actors. And then they started to get cute with it. They, they, they realized it was funny and they started to get like, it's like, oh, the worst on-screen duo was like this actor and his unhealthy relationship with women. Like, I, do, leave it alone. Do actors who were in flops, okay? But when Halle Berry won the Razzie for Catwoman, and it went, actually showed up and accepted the award, which no one had ever done before. No one accepts it. No one shows up at this fucking thing. But showed up with her Oscar in her hand that she'd won the year before for uh, Monsters Ball. And it accepted it, like, and took it seriously. Like, they were all shocked. That should have been the last Razzies ever. They've gotten lamer and lamer every year. And this year, it's actually funny again. Because the Razzies nominated all the same lame shit they always do. I think the one that I think deserved was Tom Hanks for Elvis was brutal. Uh, deserves a Razzie, but uh, they nominated a 12 year old girl who was in the movie Firestarter, which was like a direct to fucking Peacock uh, movie with Zac Efron as the guy. Firestarter, did you ever see the original? No. It's a Stephen King book or short story. Um, the, the original I liked as a kid. I forget who the girl was. It may have been the girl from Poltergeist it's who Drew died. Drew Barrymore. It was Drew Barrymore was the girl? Okay. Yeah, I believe so, yeah. uh, it was one of those movies you would see on like, the TV edited version, but I enjoyed it. And I thought maybe this new one will be cool. It was not. No one saw it. And they nominated the 12-year-old girl, which even to me was like, really? Oh, you could nominate whoever you wanted. It's not like there's voting. People, it's like three guys who just sit around and do this. And they thought, let's throw a 12-year-old girl in a bad horror movie under the bus. And the backlash was severe and deserved. I love it. I don't know who Ryan Kira is. I don't know what else she's been in. Uh, are you looking that up right now? Or what are you looking at right now? No. no, Ryan Kira Armstrong. That was the name. The name of it. But yeah, that seems uh, rude. Uh, they were very apologetic. I don't know why it took them uh, getting blowback though to not nominate. Uh, I guess she was eleven when she taped the movie, uh, saying, you know, having learned this lesson, they'd like to announce that from this point forward, uh, they are precluding any performer or filmmaker under eighteen years of age to be considered for our awards. It's, it's so funny. It's funny that they would even imagine nominating. Uh, an 11 year old girl a 12 year old girl it's like it reminds me of remember when the, the Oscars happened and the, the Onion was live tweeting the Oscars oh yeah and they were they called Quavenzene Wallace a cunt <laughs> no <laughs> and so, the backlash was insane it was like so she funny. was six like <laughs> and I get that's the joke of obviously but still you deserve everything you get for that uh, it's very very funny to me that throwing a 12 a 12 year old a 12 year old girl <laughs> that who started her amazing. first movie I, n I never saw I, well, I w Whenever I think of that movie, I think of you telling me that you watched it on an airplane and you're, the person next to you is just like, wow, this guy's really watching a, uh, a girl in her underwear uh, run around the city for hours. What was that movie called? It's so good, though. It made me cry, too. Beasts of Southern Wild. Yeah, Beasts of Southern, Southern Wild. Wild. Yeah, I never saw it. Um, but yeah, I, lo I love the idea of going after a 12-year-old for no reason. There's nothing else in the nominations that would, that would even think that you would do this. They, why did they throw in? No one is remembered that movie at all. That it's like a pointless, like left hook out of nowhere that bit them in the ass so hard. And yeah, I feel bad for the girl. She doesn't deserve this. I'm sure she's probably a fine actor. I, acting in a horror movie at 11 years old is probably not the easiest thing in the world. You think Zac Efron is fun to bounce shit off of? <laughs> I, uh, I bet it was, it was tough. And uh, I think that the Razzies deserve it all. And I, even when I read it originally, I read the nominations, I was like, that's shocking to me that they would throw a 12-year-old mm. girl in, on there. If you've shocked Jesselnik, that's, that's a problem. I was shocked when I saw who won last year. Do you know who won in the, best, the worst actor category? No. LeBron James for Space Jam 2. What? One of the great performances of our lifetime. How did Don Cheadle do his LG Rhythm? <laughs> I didn't they see if dead. that was on it or not, but you know what was also nominated? It might have even won in the uh, worst movie category. Hmm. Morbius. Ooh. Ooh, they're really, they're tempting fate now. Morbius, Morbius is great. Uh, I think in 12 years, people are going to look back and say Morbius was awesome. And, uh, and the girl, Ryan Kira Armstrong, uh, did, did deserve it. I hope she wins. Maybe did they take the nomination away? Yes, yeah, they did. They okay, so away. she's she's safe now. They took her away. People got so mad and they got rid of it. Abolish the Razzies. We don't need that shit. Uh, it's 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 lame, but it's very funny that they would misstep so so badly. 
so bigly, if you will. And now it's time for... Choo-choo! Recommendation Station. My voice is back. I have range. <laughs> Greg, what do you got this week? Uh, I'm going to do a book. Uh, it's called Stay True by Wa Shu, um, who was a long writer, longtime writer as the, in the Stay New Yorker. Stay True by Wa Shu, who? Wa Shu? Yeah. I, I think that's Hua Shu, I think would be the right Hua. way to stay it. Uh, long time writer and I always really liked his writing in the New Yorker. I don't know if you ever read him there. He was like the pop culture music critic for a really long time in the New Yorker. No longer. But this is a memoir. Um, some books I like. It's very short memoir just like for the voice of the book. Like you just like being inside of his head and like how it makes you feel. He's just like very cool and the way he approaches this is really cool. And then in this case it was like his actual voice. I listened to uh, the audiobook it centers around his time at Berkeley. It, it has his upbringing a little bit about you know being an immigrant or his parents are immigrant from Taiwan, but mostly centered around his time at Berkeley and a tragedy that happened there uh, with his best friend and his relationship with his best friend and kind of looking back on that 20 years from now. But he like it's not like sentimental. It's kind of about being like, what does it mean to be cool or to put on poses and music and like a friend that was like very open hearted in some ways, like uncool and totally different than him. It was about like that friendship. Um, it's really good. A good book on friendship. He's a great writer. I loved his voice. He was just like very cool. And like the way that he wrote it, he just like threaded the needle of not being too sentimental um, but having some wisdom on it, writing about like this crazy fucking thing that happened like 20 years later. Is it new? Is it a new book? Yeah. Uh, n it was new last year. It was one of New York Times' five best nonfiction um, books of the year, which is what turned me on to it, and I checked it out. It was great. How long is it? 200 pages, and it probably could have even been less. It's like sm like not that many words per page. Great. I will uh, I will check that out. It sounds good. Um, I'm recommending a book uh, by uh, one of my new favorite authors, a guy named S.A. Cosby, who uh, he wrote a book I think I recommended last year called Blacktop Wasteland that I really liked a lot. It's kind of like a almost like a southern noir uh, sort of writing, and I, it was, I thought it was bad as fuck. And he wrote a bo his uh, book that came out after that. I believe it came out last year. It's called Razor Blade Tears. Watch me sell this shit to you. Mm. Razor Blade Tears is about uh, two men, all right? Two guys in their like late 50s, early 60s maybe. One is like a redneck dude who's kind of like lived like a, just like, you know, like drinking beers, manual labor kind of life. And the other guy is a getting into trouble, a uh, hillbilly redneck guy. The other guy is a hardcore gang member. Spent some years in jail for like stomping a dude to death for like, for, you know, uh, killing one of his uh, gang buddies gets out these two guys have nothing in common except they both have they both have one child a gay son that they could not accept all right separately they could not accept them these two sons end up getting together fall in love they get married these guys can't even come to the wedding they hate it so much these two guys get murdered they get killed one's a journalist they get killed over something the two dads are filled with regret they hate the way they live their lives so they hate they couldn't accept their sons and they get together and they unleash hell to get revenge on the people who killed their sons. And it fucking rips. Whoa. It is awesome. It is like badass woke in a way that I just fucking love. The characters are awesome. I just, I, I love it so much. Such a great book. Razor Blade Tears by S.A. Cosby. I'll read anything this guy writes. Uh, Blacktop Wasteland was awesome. Totally different than this, but, uh, but S, uh, Razor Blade Tears, incredible book. Check it out. It sounds like the most Jesselnicky Jesselnick book. Mm-hmm. It's very, it was very, very much right up my alley, and I fucking loved it. And that was Choo -choo. Recommendation Station. Walker, before you go to the nurse, get us out of here. <laughs> Whoa, Nelly, for Tatcha, that's a spicy meatball.